Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com, and we're continuing on in our study in the Epistle to Titus, verse by verse. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful and so grateful that you are the God of all grace and that you have nothing against us but that you died in our place that we might live I just ask that you would take this message and filter out all of the error all of the foolishness and just seal only that which is truth to our hearts for it's in Christ's name I pray Amen this is going to be somewhat of a, a little bit of a, a, I guess, difficult message for me because of the fact that it, it covers a lot of ground. And I'm trying to, I'm going to try to connect some dots here that uh, maybe you'll understand uh, uh, and maybe you won't. Uh, it's not that I, ha I have no doubt whatsoever that, that uh, God answers prayer and that he will seal to our hearts only that which is truth. It, my concern is not with, uh, on, on God's end of it, but my own, as far as my own ability to take in and present uh, certain facts which sort of connect or tie in together here as we continue on in our study in Titus uh, we're going to be looking at the subject of circumcision but I also want to uh, take a look at Jeremiah chapter 14 as well as Revelation chapter 3 and I'm going to merge into this the global pandemic so that's that's quite a lot of a territory revelation chapter 3 jeremiah chapter 14 titus chapter 1 and the global pandemic covid 19. i don't know how many of you uh watching this have watched my video on the pandemic where I suggested that I believed that the there was a purpose a reason behind this pandemic that had little to do with the world at large that does not know God but has a whole lot to do with his people today the, the church which does and I don't want there to be any confusion uh, uh, as to uh, where I'm going with this. And so I'm going to try to, uh, I'll just begin with the, 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 the message to Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3. It's to the angel of the church in Laodicea, right? This is the, the angel, angel meaning messenger. The message that's being preached, which the Lord finds distasteful and spews out of his mouth, because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And I have often suggested on many occasions, God has nothing against us. So what I want to do is try to establish the fact in your minds here that it's not, I'm not being contradictive to say that on the one hand that God has nothing against us. Romans 8.1, there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. While at the same time, the Lord can say, what he says to the angel of the church in Laodicea. These are God's people. This is a church that he's speaking to. 
I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich in white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see those whom I love. I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. And I'm going to suggest to you something that I want to uh, quickly go over what I uh, included within this video. I want to I want to remind you of my position on the global pandemic, COVID-19, and how I believe that God is has uh, allowed this, you know, determined this would be a better word, uh, for the good of his people. I do not believe that it has anything to do with those who are not his people. Uh, the general uh, consensus out there, the idea uh, floating around among most Christians is, well, God is getting the nation to, to repent or he's trying to get the non-believer to repent. Uh, he's wanting to get people saved. Well, the problems I have with that, first of all, is, is that uh, goats tear those who are not his people, those who uh, will never come to Christ, no matter how many global pandemics God sends upon the earth. Uh, it's, and, and I, I, I may be, As I said, this is very difficult for me. They will not believe, no matter what God does. Just as, as uh, all of the miracles that were performed by Christ, the, uh, even the sign gifts, uh, the speaking in tongues, which all ceased because they served their purpose, and those who, were t uh, who would believe, did believe, those who were not uh, his people would never believe. No matter what happens, they'll, they'll never believe. God is working today just as he always has in the lives of his people. Okay? I am a dispensationalist. I distinguish between God's program for Israel and the church. We are not Israel. But when I, I take you into Jeremiah 14, I think you're going to see a remarkable parallel between God's dealings with his people, Israel, through the prophet Jeremiah, and in particular, his prophecy to King Zedekiah, and I, I find it astounding, actually, that we not only see ourselves there as God's people, and I, I'm Please don't get confused. We're not Israel. But we are His people, and Israel was His people. So we see ourselves there. We see God in the, in the dealing with His people there. And then I believe that this directly ties in with our present study in Titus chapter 1. So I think we were at uh, about verse 10 in Titus. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. Especially of the circumcision. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God in glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, Philippians 3, uh, 3 uh, verses 2 and 3. One of my favorite verses, as you know, I've, I've slipped that into to the introduction of this video a number of times. Who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. And that really, really does sort of sum up the whole believer's position under grace, folks. Grace, not law. If church history teaches us anything, 
it, it is that legalism, the belief that we, we must add something to grace to make, make us acceptable in God's sight, continually threatens the church. The medieval church made the system of penance a precondition of divine forgiveness. And today, some traditions identify true Christians as those who they don't drink, they don't dance, they don't smoke, they don't gamble, they don't go to parties, they don't go fishing on Sunday, and the list goes on and on and on. The first legalists in church history, the very first ones, were the Judaizers described in the New Testament. And these false teachers, they, they suggested, they asserted, they insisted that Gentile converts had to believe in Jesus and do works of the law, both, which the law, which circumcision typifies, in order to be declared righteous before God. We see that in Acts chapter 15, Galatians chapter 5. Circumcision was God's given way of His people identifying themselves with Himself under the dispensation of law. Even the, the Philippian church needed to be warned about the Judaizers, and we find this warning right here in today's passage. Paul uses the word dogs to contrast the Judaizers false gospel with the true gospel Philippians 3 2 the ancient Jews they they didn't keep dogs as pets because because the dogs that, that lived back then at that time that the, the dogs that were living in ancient Israel were wild they were unclean they were scavengers and so they often applied the word dogs to Gentiles. They regarded non-Jews as unclean. In calling members of the Judaizers dogs, Paul warns the Philippians that these Judaizers are actually filthy, even if these Judaizers believe that they are, are cleansing Gentile converts by way of circumcision. Paul calls, calls them evildoers those who mutilate the flesh. God instituted circumcision as an old covenant sacrament. We, we see that back in Genesis, all the way back in Genesis chapter 17. But its new covenant fulfillment is baptism, okay? And I'm not talking about in water here, okay? Colossians 2, 11 and 12, a spiritual baptism. That's its new covenant fulfillment. So by imposing circumcision on Gentile converts, the Judaizers basically were, what they were doing was they were turning back the clock. Okay, they were returning to the old covenant era of shadows and denying the sufficiency of the cross, the sufficiency of the work of Jesus Christ, that His work was, was sufficient. They were denying that. That's not, that's not enough. It's not enough that we, we have Christ. We've got to also keep the law. That's what we're looking at right here in our present text. The significance of Philippians 3.2 is, is, is seen in the fact that old covenant priests who mutilated themselves became unfit for service. Under the new covenant, requiring the circumcision of Gentile uh, believers is akin to mutilating God's priestly nation. 1 Peter 2.5. So the Judaizers, despite their intent, they really, what they were really promoting was uncleanness. 
Folks, true circumcision is heart circumcision. The baptism into union with Christ by faith. We see that in Romans 6 and in Colossians chapter 2. This sets us apart as holy, which is why all who trust in Christ alone are the circumcision. They are the true worshipers of God, Philippians 3.3. 3. We are circumcised in the heart when we are baptized into Christ. That's, that's not in, in washing in water. When we trust in Christ alone for deliverance. Now, I'm not talking about redemption, just redemption here. I'm talking about deliverance, saved. There is nothing that we can add to what Christ did on our behalf to make us acceptable to God. I have said this until I'm blue in the face. We are to rest in Christ as our only hope in life and in death. Romans chapter 2 states, Paul states there in Romans chapter 2, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter that's, that's law, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Every person, folks, every person who professes to be a born-again Christian ought to read Jeremiah 14 very, very, very carefully. As a, as a prophet, Jeremiah, he pronounced God's judgment upon the people of his time for their wickedness. He was especially, he was especially concerned with false worship, false insincere worship, and, and a failure to trust God. That was his primary concern. And what I have wrestled with, what I have struggled with, especially this, this morning in preparing to deliver this video, is people misunderstanding me and thinking that I'm contradicting myself when I say that on the one hand, God has nothing against us, which is true. And yet, He loves and He disciplines those whom He loves. Both are true, folks. Both are true. I understand more than most that the church is not Israel, okay? But we see some remarkable parallels here in God's dealing with Israel, His people, as far as their idolatry was concerned, their false worship was concerned, and how He responded to His people. It wasn't out of, out of hate. It wasn't because God had something against His people, okay? Look, I, I don't know how many times I've pointed out, you know, Israel wandering, here they are wandering through the wilderness. You know, the, the only two that, that, that enter into the promised land, Joshua and Caleb, even Moses, was laid to rest in the wilderness. He was not allowed by God to enter into the promised land. Well, you can't tell me, no one's going to ever convince me that all of, uh, all of God's people except Joshua and Caleb and, and uh, you know, went to hell. These were God's people. God's people today can perish in their own, in, 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 in what... Let me, let, me, let me see if I can say this right. God's people today can perish in the wilderness. That's what I'm saying. It doesn't mean that, that God doesn't love us. 
I'm not contradicting myself here, but no believer will ever die in their sins. If Christ died in our place, we cannot die, but physically here, okay, our entire life's work can, can go up in smoke. Our, a man's entire life's work can amount to hay, wood, and stubble at the judgment seat of Christ. He can live his entire life in the flesh, walking in the flesh, not the Spirit, walking in law, not grace. That's my point. And I don't know how many times I've pointed out my belief as well as, it's, and it's not solely just my belief, it's the, it's the belief of many others as well, that, that the modern Christianity today, the world religious system based on human merit is in a dry spot, folks, okay? Where that there's, a, it's, it's a wilderness. Where that there's a thirst for knowledge, knowledge of the truth. There's a hunger for God's Word. And there, there's a thirst for knowledge. And many of His people are today. They don't have the peace, the joy, the rest that God would, would have them have because they're not trusting in Him. They're trusting in themselves. That's, that's what I'm saying. I want to I want to quickly go through Jeremiah 14. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it, but let's take a look at that. Jeremiah 14, that which came as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah in regard to the the drought. Okay. Now I want you to keep in mind, folks. There there are uh, when we talk about war and famine and drought and pestilence, these are physical things. These are real life things, which which have a, a spiritual counterpart, so, so to speak. There, there is a spiritual drought as well as a physical drought. There's a spiritual drought. There's a spiritual famine. There's, a spirit, there's spiritual warfare, okay? And there's spiritual sickness, pestilence. I want you to keep that in mind. That which came as the word of the Lord Jeremiah in regard to, to the drought. Judah mourns and her gates languish. They sit on the ground in mourning, and, and the cry of Jerusalem has ascended. What is that saying? It's saying that the, the, the people assembled at the gates, the usual places of, of, of gathering together to meet, to, to, to fellowship, and they are in deep mourning, and they sit humbly on the ground. Gates, gates, the place of public concourse in each city. And, and it looks sad. It's, it's because it's, it's no longer frequented, you know, uh, visited. It's, it's no, longer, no longer do people frequent these places. Just read Isaiah chapter 3, Isaiah chapter 24. They want nourishment they want wholesome nourishment but judah mourns that is the inhabitants of judah those of the house of judah mourned because because of the drought and the famine that were upon the land verse 3 their nobles have sent their servants for water they have come to the cisterns and found no water they have returned with their vessels empty they have been put to shame and humiliated, and they cover their heads. When they came, when, when, they, when they saw them come with their empty vessels, you know, they were, they were longing to see him come back with water. They were longing to see him return expecting that they would have brought water with them, you know, for their, for their refreshment. But to their great disappointment and their confusion, the servants didn't bring any. 
Verse 4, because the ground is cracked, for there's been no rain on the land. The farmers have been put to shame. They have covered their heads. For even the doe in the field has given birth only to abandon her young because there is no grass. The wild donkeys, they stand on the bare heights. They pant for air like jackals. Their eyes fail for there is no vegetation. Although our iniquities testify against us, O Lord, act for your name's sake. Listen, truly our apostasies have been many. We have sinned against you. Verse 8, O hope of Israel, its Savior in time of distress, why are you like a stranger in the land or like a traveler who has pinched, pitched his tent for the night? Why are you like a man dismayed, like a mighty man who cannot save? Yet you are in our midst, O Lord, and we are called by your name. Do not forsake us. Verse 10, thus says the Lord to this people. Now listen, folks, listen to this. Even so, they have loved to wander. They have not kept their feet in check. Therefore, the Lord does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and call their sins to account. So the Lord said to me, do not pray for the welfare of this people. When they fast, I am not going to listen to their cry. And when they offer burnt offering and grain offering, I am not going to accept them. Rather, I am going to make an end of them by the sword, famine, and what? Pestilence. Pestilence. Just a little intermission here before I continue. It's uh, once again, I want to point out how that my, my big concern here is that people become confused in, in thinking that somehow I'm suggesting that, that God has that same attitude toward his people today as he did Israel It's, you've got to keep in mind, folks, that today, within the church today, there are, look, I don't know how to, I don't know how to explain this, except to say that when, when the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness, these were God's people. It was, it was God's chosen people. But among those people, okay, among God's people, wandering in the wilderness. There were those for whom God did not... He, there were... I guess the best way I can explain it is, is that there were sheep and, and goats, wheat and tare, even then. Okay? Even then. It, it's... We have, we have within the church today, we have believers and we have non-believers. God has nothing against us. He has nothing against the believer. Romans 8, 1 stands true. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But as I pointed out in, in Jesus' words in, in to the the church there at Laodicea, he loves these, these people, his people there. He's calling on them to repent. It doesn't mean that he has, he, he, he finds the message there at Laodicea so distasteful that he spews it out of his mouth. But it doesn't mean that he has anything against his people. He loves his people. And he's calling upon them to repent. We see the same thing happen, happening right here in Jeremiah. 
at the beginning, when I first started reading this, there were those that were sitting at the gates mourning. Okay? Verse 13, But I, Lord God, I said, Look, the prophets are telling them, this is Jeremiah here talking, talking to the Lord. Look, the prophets are telling them, You will not see the sword, nor will you have famine, but I will give you lasting peace in this place. There's a modern day counterpart, folks, to, to those words. Then the Lord said to me, The prophets are prophesying falsehood in my name. I have neither sent them, nor commanded them, nor spoken to them. They are prophesying to you a false vision, divination, futility, and the deception of their own minds. Verse 15, Therefore, thus says the Lord, concerning the prophets who are prophesying in my name, although it was not I who sent them, yet they keep saying, there will be no sword or famine in this land. By sword and famine, these prophets shall meet their end. False prophets, folks. He's, he's talking about false prophets. Verse 16, The people also to whom they are prophesying will be thrown out into the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword, and there will be no one to bury them, neither them, nor their wives, nor their sons, nor their daughters, for I will pour out their own wickedness on them. Verse 17, You will say to this, this word to them, Let my eyes flow down with tears night and day, and let them not cease, for the virgin daughter of my people has been crushed with a mighty blow, with a sorely infected wound. Virgin daughter. Cities are... Are, are sometimes called virgins, which were never taken. So Jerusalem here, it having never been taken since, since it was in the hands of the people of Judah, its inhabitants were, had, had yet never been, to, up to this point, it had never been taken captive. But now they would be. That is the great breach, the, the great, the, the grievous blow that's, that's spoken of, which is given as a reason for sorrow and mourning. And folks, the law was never given to the church. Verse 18. If I go out to the country, behold, those slain with the sword. Or if I enter the city, behold, diseases of famine. For both prophet and priest have gone roving about in the land that they do not know. Have you completely rejected Judah or have you loathed Zion? Why have you stricken us so that we are beyond healing? We waited for peace, but nothing good came, and for a time of healing, but behold, terror. We know our wickedness, O Lord, the iniquity of our fathers, for we have sinned against you. Do not despise us for your own name's sake. Do not disgrace the throne of your glory. Remember and do not annul your covenant with us. Do you think God... Did that, folks? Of course he did. He was faithful to his people, just as he's faithful to his people today. Verse 22, Are there any among the idols of the nations who give rain, or can the heavens grant showers? Is it not you, O Lord, our God? Therefore we hope in you, for you are the one who has done all these things. And I hear people say, oh, God, God, God wouldn't send. This is the devil sending this, this global pandemic. 
this is the devil causing the, these wars and this is the devil that, that causes famine and disease and, and drought and, and, on, and so on and so forth. For you are the one who has done all these things. Uh, in prophecy, folks, and that's what we're looking at here in Jeremiah, there, there's four different kinds of double references. In this chapter, chapter 14, you can, you can, you can see type, uh, another one called type gap. There's another one called unforeseen partial. Uh, just gap by itself. The fourth uh, one, actually that's the first one, You've got gap, then you've got type gap. Unforeseen, partial. Uh, th these are the things, some of the things that they fill your head full of here in Bible college. The, the, the fourth gap is not seen. There's Actually, there's very few pure gap prophecies. But point being, Application to the New Covenant can be seen in God's dealing with His people, Israel. Minus, of course, that which does not apply or carry over because of the New Covenant. Okay? Such as, you know, uh, for example, the words, Therefore the Lord doth not accept them. He will now remember their iniquity and visit their sins. Well, we know that's not true. Of, of the New Testament church. Our sins have been cast as far as the east is from the west, buried in the depths of the sea. He says, I'll remember them no more. So you can't, there's, it's not an exact parallel is what I'm saying. But what I'm saying, suggesting to you folks, is that when you look at Jeremiah 14, you're looking in a mirror in a sense. You're seeing yourself there. You're seeing God's dealings with you there. You're seeing, you're seeing God's dealings with Israel there under a different dispensation. But there are, there are many things that are the same. There, of course, there are things which cannot apply to us. But it does apply to the apostate religious system. Okay? Our parallel is seen there you know, us as well. It doesn't matter that this was His people Israel. God deals with His people in many of the same ways throughout any dispensation. Jeremiah warned King Zedekiah that all of the inhabitants of Jerusalem would die of pestilence due to the transgressions of God's people. Okay? Now, I didn't make that up. I suggest that this global pandemic is the result of God's people transgressing into something other than spirit and truth worship. Okay? Now, you don't have to agree with that, but that's my position on this. The proclamation of another gospel, a world religious system based on human merit. That's why you're quarantined, in my opinion. Okay? And priests, priests could only fix this by carrying out the right ritual. Listen to me. The transgressors had to supply the priests with an unblemished lamb for sacrifice to appease God. And that guilt offering would settle the offense in front of God. But that was only temporary. A type. Therefore, the remedy, the cure, can only be a return to the gospel, the sufficiency of the unblemished, all-sufficient sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. A fact that I pointed out recently in my video on, on COVID-19. 
The only way that a student of the scriptures can wiggle out of this is to suggest, well, that God's not, he's not really sovereign. He's not really sovereign. But, you know, this virus is just a coincidence. It's, you know, because it comes around every hundred years or, or whenever, you know. It's like, you know, you know, they say an asteroid, an earth, a near uh, extinction a level event, you know, asteroid, it can, it only comes around, you know, every, I don't know, so many hundreds of thousands of years or whatever. Uh, folks, God could send an asteroid, uh, a huge asteroid today. He could send another one tomorrow and he could send another one the day after that. So, you know, Another way to wiggle out is, is to say, well, you know, this is God's warning to the non-redeemed for their, for, of their need for Christ. You know, he, and I, you know, as if he uses scare tact tactics. Trust me, he doesn't need to do that. So neither of those are true. God is very much concerned with his people today. And the church, the body of Christ, is the only body of believers in the world today. Israel's been set aside in unbelief until God has finished. His program for the church is complete. Until he's done with the church. He doesn't turn his attention back to Israel. He will. He'll turn his attention again back to Israel. He'll, he'll complete his program for the for, for Israel, but not until he's done with the church. The church is the only religion, quote unquote, on earth. And when you have something as monumental as a global pandemic, you are not going to convince me that it, it doesn't have anything to do with the church. The condition of the church, the state of the church, the health of the church. Of course, COVID-19 has to do with his people, but just as we see in Jeremiah, there is a religious system that is, is not truly Christian, which his people are in the midst of. God is not working to save to, to deliver that redeem even that world religious system based on human merit. He's not trying to redeem it. You know, it, man, that's an awful thing. I gotta, I gotta improve on it. I gotta make it better. You know, that which is involved in idol worship, the worship of self, placing man above God, that involves itself in false worship, false humility, unacceptable sacrifice, which in, in teaching and in practice, it denies the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. As I said, there are, there are literal wars, famine, drought, pestilence, but the physical always typifies the spiritual, always. Just as Israel, wandering lost in the wilderness, typifies spiritual dryness and loss of, of, of direction. Within the religious system today, there are wars, infighting, famine, you know, a hunger for truth, drought, a thirst for truth, and disease, spiritual sickness, ill health. And folks, we know all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. 2 Timothy 3, 16. Not all Scripture was written to us, but all Scripture was written for us. 
it, it is astounding just how much we see both ourselves as well as the world religious system based on human merit in Jeremiah chapter 14. And it's astounding just how much of what we see God hating in Jeremiah 14, we see Him hating in the New Testament Scriptures. Even in the very passage that we're now studying, in dealing with the subject and being confronted with the subject of circumcision, which is not outward, but inward. And that's where we're going to pick up in our next study. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Stay safe out there. Until next time, thanks for watching.